Thank you. I'm honored to be able to um, travel from Hong Kong here um, to um, talk about uh, this incident response triage framework in the age of the APT. So I think. Uh, oops. Hello. Hello. All right. Much thanks for the um, very good introduction of my uh, background. So without further ado, um, the agenda for today is I. First, we put out the context about the incident response triage um, the process and where triage fit in. And then I will talk about um, incident verification with a systematic approach. And then I will talk about a uh, so-called potentiality framework uh, model for separate e assessment. So, um, so um, before we put out the context of what where of where all these uh, three R things come in. First, I would want to talk about the enterprises deliver. Um, you know, large uh, organizations when they deal with these uh, new, um, this uh, modern threat of APT, they start to have new um, challenges that they have to overcome. Back in the olden days, when the um, when malware and attacks and hacks and on the uh, on the internet were not so prevalent, um, they may a lot of company may be able to get by uh, on a case by case basis. But these days, attacks and alerts and, and all these things come, uh, keeps pouring in. You know, the sarcastically, the more you spend money, you know, into all these monitoring and. Uh, in IDS and firewalls and all that stuff, the more you, you throw money into it, the more problem you're creating for yourself. You know, a lot more volume incident that you were previously unaware of suddenly become an issue, and you may not always have the capability to deal with all these uh, new new things that might have been there all along that you just discovered and have to deal with it. Um, the, the the alerts and attack and threat that keep pouring in these days a huge volumes, a huge influx of incidents, and all of them might look time critical as well. Um, and then if you have a, um, a more mature uh, desktop infrastructure or uh, infrastructural setup, you might have to deal with this so-called horizontal problem as opposed to the vertical problem of, you know, of the um, lesser use. And this applies to forensics as well. Um, like if you work in a, a um, legal law enforcement, as a cop, um, you might have to deal with different conflicts, um, and you may have to handle up to a handful of boxes per incident. But these days, with large organizations, the conflicts that you are expecting are pretty much well known. But you have to deal with like thousands and thousands of boxes all at once, and this is what I call the horizontal um, challenge. And uh, it falls down to a lack of resources. You don't always have the right um, hand to deal with all these uh, new uh, threat that you are seeing, and you don't have sufficient tools and not enough money. It's always the case. And what this leads to, from our experience, it leads to basically two things: false negatives. Um, if you got, if you get by. Um, you, if you get by well enough, you might be tricked into uh, believing you're safe. And ironically, 99.9% of the cases, you might be right. I mean, fake AVs, we've all seen fake AVs, and some of us might have even spent time to reverse engineer a fake AV. And almost every time we reverse engineer a fake AV, if it's just a fake AV, nothing, nothing more. Um, and this, and the more you find out that not a real issue, you start to think that whenever you say uh, a fake daily, um, you might at that point decide that it's not worth um, going deeper um, into checking more. And um, this is what we call the black swan event, because every one swan we see on white in color. And the more swan you see, and the more swan you try to analyze, the more you believe that all the swans are white in color. But everyone's in the blue one, you might come across a black swan and you would be pretty messed up at that point. 
and like accuracy companies um, where they purchase you know ideas alert or outsource MSSP to providers they um, might not have the appropriate counterparties in house to deal with all these new stuff that they discover all these under that that stuff coming in the people that they hired before was not prepared to handle um, all these ideas alerts and, um, and new um, alert that they keep coming in from the MSSP and a lot of them actually keep up they have policies like if an alert has not been handled after a month it got thrown away it actually happened in real world listed companies which is really sad now enter APP APP is a noun it's an excuse you throw on when you get home so you say it's not a thought because the enemies are too late. Now every time we see ADP, uh, chances are it's an excuse. But really, what ADP means um, that your adversaries are really out to get you. Okay, hungry bears. Um, I know it's very shame. It's no joke. If you are trapped in a forest and you're chased by a hungry bear, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the other guy. That much, <laughs> that much has been true uh, for maybe the past 10 years or so, when um, with limited resources, you don't try to invest in all different types of protection possible because you only have this, this much resources. You always try to gauge your peers. Um, there actually have been you know, cross company uh, committees uh, devoted to this effort. Like in the financial world, you have MS Isaac, where you can try to gauge the the sense score, you know, among your peers. And you and if you are a responsible enterprise, you always want to try to get just a little bit, you know, ahead of the curve. It may well be effective before APT become prevalent. Um, but mistakenly not, APT has been here all along for more than 10 years. It is just um, only in recent years that it's become more visible um, to the business world. Uh, perhaps because we now have a little bit of the tools to get a glimpse of the, the impact of APT. Now, um, because back in the old days, attacks, threats that come in, are mostly opportunistic attack. Um, so if you try to stay ahead of the status quo, by and large, you are pretty safe. On the other hand, these days with APT, your adversaries are really out to get you. So you really have to go back to the, the, the fundamentals, all this stuff about defense in depth and layer um, security and, and all that stuff. That is this. Uh, military model called the UDA loop. Um, the best way to visualize it and it's most adopted in um, a dogfight scenario. You have a pilot fighter, um, you see something blipping on the, the radar, um, you would observe you know, a blip on the radar, try to orientate the cell and to decide and to act. It's a bit like the then, you know, chain, um, the cycle, uh, but this is mainly for dealing with the adversaries, and scarily, it's actually very effective because nowadays you are not trying to deal with a hungry bear, you are dealing with a cunning adversary. And the lesson in um, the order loop is you've got to think and act faster than your opponent to be able to survive. Um, I guess the malware world. The yeah, attack these days are very asymmetric in nature. It doesn't take much for a hacker group to obfuscate or um, uh, uh, generate a script with a server size obfuscation and generate a obfuscated version of the malware payload every time you, you download it. But it takes a lot more resources to, to analyze, um, to de obfuscate, and uh, get at the core of, of the malware. So this is kind of like a denial of service attack scenario. You know, the attacker can use little resources, and if you do it the old school way, you would, your resources will be used up um, no matter how much resource you throw into it. So I argue that the way to deal with this asymmetric problem is to 
tighten your outer loop to be able to react faster. So this is the solution, faster outer loop. And the tool that I propose is a systematic triage process. Now, um, I know it's going to be a little boring uh, for people who are already in the incident response industry. Um, but I want to highlight a little bit the fundamentals different between forensics and incident response because um, like forensics, you've got a crime scene. The crime has happened or suspect to have happened and you're supposed to answer the question, you know, did the crime happen? And the board of you and 1H um, about the crime that has happened is very focused. You have a hypothesis. You're trying to prove or disprove. And that, that much is very well um, defined. But the incident response, typically, you start with an alert. Um, maybe from your IDS sensor or your MSSP that tell you something is wrong with this particular uh, request uh, on your proxy. Now, you have an alert. Um, the alert trigger. So what the hell just happened? So how serious was that? And how to deal with it? That much is very less defined than the forensic process. Um, we don't even know whether it's a real alert because we don't want to MSSP keeps uh, pouring in force alert all the times, so and that's why a lot of company uh, will be trained to disregard all these alerts that are coming from MS MSSP. Uh, truth be told, a lot of MSSPs alert are really false alert. Um, and you should not be tricked into believing all the alerts are false. And the answer is a proper triage process. Now, triage. It comes from the medical world. Um, it's a principle of spotting um, uh, casualties, uh, sorry, s sorting out issues. Um, to make it a more broad sense um, in, a, in a battlefield so that you can give the proper treatment to um, different situations. And this is a typical triage check. You see there are four categories. Um, the zero categories is uh, when the, the subject has already died and there's no triage necessary. Um, and then the first category is you have to have a rapid treatment. Uh, and the second category is for people who are suffering uh, less from wounds and you can wait until you handle those who need immediate treatment first. Um, and then there are small bruises that you don't have to um, really deal with it on the site. You can just maybe uh, set it back to the medics. But the idea, the idea is clear. You sort uh, situations into categories and deal with it appropriately. Now, we look at the traditional uh, incident response process, the six step process put out by the, uh, the SENSE model. Nowhere did you see triage. So where does it fit in? It actually should fit in to the second stage um, identification. Now, um, in a typical MSSP model, or if you have uh, your own IDS alert, you might have purchased or get a consultant to write you alerts, uh, uh, signatures. So the first thing that start would be the report interpretation. Um, when you see a report from your IDS or your MSSP, it has a suggested severity rating. But you should not pick the severity rating at face value because um, they are lacking information about your specific setup specific to your site. So you have to take it with a grain of salt and try to reconcile it with the thing that you really have. And you have verification. You have to verify whether the alert is actually relevant to your um, scenario and then you do your own severity um, assessment and prioritize it accordingly. Um, as I said, the report typically comes as an alert from your IDS or antivirus or SIM um, or your MSSP might, um, might have um, uh, consolidated all these alerts into one single alert. Um, you typically have an assigned severity and you have to make sense about it first. And then you have to determine whether the the alert is actually relevant. Um, people who 
people have been in that in this situation like I've seen like serve you on earth and you have no serve you software in soul because you can tell right away that this on earth is not relevant to your scenario. Now um, you also have security assessment. Um, you have to assess the damage that has already been done and also the potential for further damage. I will talk more about this uh, at a later stage. Um, and, and then prioritization. You deal with the most severe cases first. But what is the most severe case? I'll talk about that at a later stage. Now, with verification, back in the old days, um, there are not many tools available. But these days, we have a whole bunch of incident response uh, tools for you to gather evidence and try to verify uh, whether an attack has actually happened. Now, I'm going to talk about each of these two uh, one by one so that you will eat your dinner and your big time. No, I'm just kidding. Now, this old saying that if you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this is precisely the problem we are facing now. Uh, back in the old days, because there are not many tools available, even if you develop them in-house, it might not be so comprehensive as you get these days. Um, so back in the old days, life was more easy because if you can't deal with a, a specific scenario, um, there's nothing much to be blamed because there's just not much tool available. But these days, you are swarmed with different tools. Um, and I, uh, at times, again, I've seen uh, analysts being uh, swarmed by, by all these options, what tools to, to use. Typically, an analyst will try to get at the uh, the most nearby tool and trying to do stuff about the incident because that was what is most available to him. But I argue it's not the right approach because if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we try to put order, try to put um, uh, order and process into this. And the right question to ask, there are several uh, principle models to follow. First is the ambitious principle. Um, so essentially, the Alicia's principle, uh, there are four questions to ask. So what question are you trying to answer? What data do you need to answer that question? How do you extract and analyze that data? And what would that data tell you? This is all very fundamental. And in fact, um, it, would be, it would be interesting um, to ponder about why we haven't been working this way. Uh, for all this long, because if you look at it, it is this the fundamentals of doing forensics, not even incident response. With forensics, maybe there's more leeway, because no matter how pressing you are, um, there's always a little leeway for you to redo stuff or try other tools. But with incident response, like, the leeway for wasting time on non productive investigation is very limited. So all the more um, for incident response, we have to stick to a systematic approach by forcing us to ask the right question because these are the questions that would really help you solve the problem. Now, I'm going to introduce a four-tree model uh, that is uh, very much adopted in traditional safety engineering. And it also comes as a surprise to me that why didn't we in the information security industry uh, adopt more um, a little bit of these systematic approaches? Um, there are many tools to uh, help you build a bot tree, um, including this thing called the Open FTA. This is generated using Open FTA. You just put in the, the conditions uh, and the uh, pre and post conditions, uh, and it will generate a tree for you. Um, I guess it's a rather simplified example, uh, but I guess the idea is very simple. You recognize, um, you recognize these uh, gate symbols. Um, go back to you know the college first year stuff, being a um, having an end gate and all gate. Let me zoom in. So, like for example, if you have a workstation that has been compromised, this much is what the android tells you. And if you want to verify whether this presentation has been compromised, you will recognize there are three components that have to hold true at the same time for this claim to be true. So that's why we have an engage here. So, um, so 
with a four tree, so there are three components that have to hold true in, uh, all at the same time for a work station uh, compromise claim to be true. First, the payload would have to be really have been downloaded to the workstation. It's not blocked or, or failed uh, or traversing a firewall due to some fragmentation or things like that. So you have to assess this part. And you have to assess whether the antivirus has failed to block as well because um, if a, 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 a payload has been blocked by the antivirus, there's no point in furthering uh, uh, further investigation. And then the target component would have to be vulnerable as well. Um, you are in good position if you have the alert because the alert typically come from your SIM or IDS or MSSP. They always have the CVE number or a particular exploit number and you can correlate it with your uh, inventory. At the patch level, you can determine right away whether, uh, whether the target component is vulnerable. Uh, but there are also other factors like you have to uh, first uh, whether you have you know that component in your system and whether the patch level is of a sufficiently high level and it's a whole bunch of work so now you have to assess these three parts and I say you know in order to determine this part it involves so much work uh, so what would you do first because any component any co component out of the three if you decided to be forced there's no point you can skip all the, the rest of the work. So the answer, so the answer is to look at this part. Now let me see. The question you're trying to answer is whether the workstation has been compromised. And as I said, there has been there are three components that have to uh, be satisfied. So you do a, a breakfast search, which is a fancy term to mean you look from top to bottom. Now, out of the three questions, if you ask this easiest to answer question first, you have a much better um, potential to skip the other two more difficult questions. So you should first look at whether the malware panel has been successfully downloaded to the workstation. So what data do you need to answer that question? Well, obviously, you look into the, the web proxy log to see whether there is a, uh, a download access into this workstation. So, um, why we try to assess this one in the verification process first? Because this answering this question will give us the most chances of skipping the rest. Now, this is the idea. You always try to answer the question that would allow you to skip the rest of the question. So um, that's the idea of all three analysis. Um, of course, in order for this to happen, you uh, really have to look at your organization to see uh, what uh, protective measures you have in place and pre-build this tree. Um, there are a number of tools that will help you put together a tree like that. Some will all even help you automate the process. But once you have this tree, um, you should stick it to your standard operating procedure because then your analyst will be able to, uh, to do less work. Um, no, that's not the idea. Your analyst will be able to spend his resources on the more productive activities. Now, um, there are several guiding principles. Um, I talked about the analysis principle before and applied to the fourth tree. And there are also two other fundamental principles that are also fundamental to uh, traditional uh, forensic practices. The local exchange principle, you know, every contact leaves a trace, you just have to know where to look for it. Um, now, I guess this is a little bit um, more of an art than science, um, but, uh, but nevertheless, you have to have domain knowledge. You have to know your infrastructure well enough, um, and this provides the, the, uh, the most opportunity for in-house uh, staff to put together um, a board tree. I mean, once you know how your infrastructure looks like, you will be in a better position to put in a board tree to help you do your 
um, incident response process. Now, um, another very important principle I found is the Occam's razor. Uh, a lot of us are very familiar with Occam's razor, which says if there are two you know, competing theories, you always stick to the simplest one. But of course, the simplest one um, is a matter of opinion. And I find a, uh, a better approach is to consider facts versus inferences. Um, the idea is if you got um, if you got multiple theories, uh, the theory that make uh, the fewest inferences um, would be preferable. Like to take an example, um, one of your high value workstation had just been compromised. Um, it is equally likely that you know some of your um, competitor has sent in a spy uh, and sneak into your complex and put in a USB and uploaded the virus to compromise this particular workstation. Alternatively, this workstation, the guy using it might have served at, uh, some questionable website and, and caused the virus. Given these two competing theories, um, the one that makes the less uh, the fewest inferences, which is the, the resident that just got it off the website, would be preferable. So the first thing you check is to verify whether this box has served to questionable site and downloaded questionable payload. Now this is the idea of um, Occam's Racer's application to this incident response scenario. Now, um, now let's go to security assessment and prioritization. In the real world, security assessment and prioritizations can be different things. It's not always that the most severe uh, uh, scenario would um, would warrant the, um, the the highest priority treatment. It, there, there are economical constraints, there are political constraints, there are procedural constraints, and maybe even geological geographical constraints as well. Like you only have these guys at this particular location, even though it's better to do things elsewhere, it might not be possible at this moment. But the, for the sake of um, for the sake of presenting the model, we would assume you know the two things are one and the same. Now um, some boring old school stuff. We all know that risk is a um, uh, has the these I mentioned likelihood, impact, and asset value. Um, and um, it's very tempting to throw around a risk matrix, a traditional textbook risk matrix like this, to determine the risk. However, in an incident response scenario, the likelihood is always 100%, and the risk matrix will not be of any value in this case. So when we look at the, uh, the risk, now the likelihood is always 100%, and the asset value, you only you know what yourself is worth. So we are left with impact. Now what's impact? The impact can be determined by the threat and the vulnerability uh, of your system to these threats. Now, um, how can you gauge vulnerability, specifically your patch levels and vulnerability scans reports? Um, if, uh, and it's easily achievable, any enterprise management software will allow you to uh, build an inventory uh, of the patchable and uh, any well scan product can give you the well scan report. Now, uh, we'll have to track. Now, in a traditional setting, um, the, the threat is usually considered by a linear scale. You have small threat that warrants standard mitigation, and there are serious threat, typically threat that you have not seen before. Um, that, like if you have you know a whole bunch of machine that get infected and the more and even though you um, we install uh, we view all this system the same malware keeps popping up um, if you have scenario like this that you have not seen before you will be tempted to put in intensive care in those cases and fourth re neglected dimension is that there are also other scenarios other situations where the potential for more damage and more scope is possible. Um, and I argue that threats 
that have more of a potential to cause further damage, it's actually more resource demanding. Uh, it warrants even more resources than the damage that has already been done. So I'm saying the potential for further damage is of a more critical uh, value to consider than the damage that has already been caused. Um, and this only makes sense if you think back our battlefield uh, analogy. Um, a patient, um, a, someone who suffered uh, from wounds, if, an, if the injury is so serious that there's not much that can be done, then would be, it would be more uh, productive to spend your medical attention to someone who has suffered injury but there's a high chance of uh, bringing him back to uh, a, a normal state so that he could uh, carry on with his business. Now, this is the, the idea. Now, um, to look at potential scope and damage, I present a four quadrant model. Um, it, uh, this four quadrant model has like two dimensions. First is the artifact hemisphere and the intellectual hemisphere. And on the left is things that are about yourself. And on the right are uh, factors that belong to your enemies. Uh, it would be tempting to throw the, the Chinese uh, Sun Tzu um, out of war analogy, you know, know yourself and know your enemy kind of, uh, kind of stuff, but I would uh, refrain from that shame. So artifact hemisphere, it's about your compromised abilities and malware capability. Uh, and then in the intellectual hemisphere, you have exploit capability and the ease of attack. I will talk about each of them in due course. Now, with regard to compromised entities, you look at push defenses and the back doors that have been opened. Um, like if you have a firewall, if, um, if you see an attack that happened inside the firewall, and you know that one of your uh, defense has been breached. And you have to look at the reason why and the, the method with which uh, this compromise has happened. Because if, because if a defense has been breached, it implies that similar attack can also breach your defense via the same method. And this would nullify the equation you put in, in your defense infrastructure. And on the other hand, you have to consider the, uh, the malware capability. And by malware, I don't mean just the you know, PDF attachment. I also refer to the tools that has been used to attack you. Um, there are patterns that can be gleaned from an RDS alert. There are patterns that can be gleaned from a uh, firewall. Uh, and you've seen attack tools uh, uh, well enough, you can almost tell the exact tools that have been used to attack you. Now, in the intellectual hemisphere, there are exploit capability issues. Those are unanticipated risks. Uh, one thing that I've seen all too often in organizations um, in their security model um, is a soul piping situation. The individual component has been designed meticulously with all the risks and threat and vulnerability consider and only immaterial residual risk has left behind. Um, individually, they're all secure. They're all secure with some immaterial residual risk. The thing that happened most uh, in the real world is when this system you know, um, come together, the interplay of risk, uh, when risk, immaterial risk would chain up with another system immaterial risk and become a material risk. I guess a, a good way to consider this, uh, this uh, issue is to look at the uh, recent Swiss cheese model. Security is a bit like uh, a Swiss cheese. Um, there are small holes. You know, every productive system always have residual risk. And um, normally, because all these in the immaterial risk, they don't line up uh, uh, all that great. So with a defense in that model like this, if the first two layers of your defense has been breached, you still have your remaining two layers. But the thing is, 
um, at some point, these immaterial risks can line up and open up a, a, a channel of um, vulnerability where the attack can come through and it will be messed up. So, um, so you will look at the interplay of risk and the most important uh, quadrant, I argue, is the ease of attack methods. Now, we all know that if a hacker got in using strict PD tools, it's very different from uh, a hardcore attack such as a Stuxnet, you know, having four true zero days. You know you are dealing with a completely different kind of adversaries. Um, and if you know that you're dealing, if you know the hardcore level of your uh, adversary, this would become variable in directing your mitigation. Now, with the ease of attack component, uh, just as in all other metrics, it's a kind of like a moving target. That's why we all come to these conferences to learn about other peoples, learn from our peers about the current security landscape. But I would uh, I would follow a ease of attack model, uh, more simplified like this, with five levels of uh, of severity. We look at the ease of attack by looking at the possibility for this attack to have succeeded. Like for example, um, with a in a while zero day that has not been uh, widely patched, if you got pulled, um, it's likely that the adversaries that you are dealing with were just opportunistic, opportunistic script keys. And it is a reasonable assumption to make uh, on the other hand, if you uh, get targeted with some rather um, implausible attack, like a spear phishing email targeting just your senior executive uh, with highly plausible content and a zero day, that means your adversary would have already had some idea about your people. And this means it's not opportunistic, it's quite determined. Um, to um, to compromise you, and if you found something like this, it would be reasonable ground to uh, divert more of your resources to deal with the problem at hand, because you are not dealing with some uh, ordinary hacker. You might well be dealing with uh, an industrial player. The idea, that's the idea of the ease of attack metrics. So what do threat analysts need to know in order to put together all these metrics? Um, of course, you would have to be able to tell whether a uh, particular exploit is currently widespread and the, uh, the corresponding patch has not been published. So you would have to know about, um, your analysts would have to know about the current threat landscape, about the patch scenarios, um, and he would have to also have an idea of how easy and reliable to mount a particular attack to, in order to, to uh, put together that matrix. And he would have to also know the consequence of a compromise. Um, he would have to know the interplay of risk. And of course, it would be ideal if, uh, if the analysts have malware reverse engineering skills. But um, that's the idea. Now, um, now that's pretty much uh, towards the end of my presentation, and in conclusion, I am presenting a triage process, uh, part of the, the uh, identification phase, and presented for the verification part of triage, a fault tree analysis model, and for security assessment, a potential, a potentiality based model. And I hope that with these tools, um, you would be able to build up your uh, triage process with a much more systematic and effective uh, uh, execution. Now, thank you for your time. Is there any question?